Thank you, Helen, and good morning to everybody. Um, I, I was going to be very kind of go rogue without a sports coat, but then uh, since it's going to be filmed, I guess I better, better look good. Well, today's a little bit less formal. Yesterday we did our thing at Queen Square, and I had on my suit. But, but, but today, and I, I'm open for um, people, if they want to ask questions, you know, please raise your hand. Uh, we're, a, we're a little bit less time constrained today, so I think we can go through things in a little bit more of a somewhat of a leisurely way. Anyway, I'm going to give you an overview today. I'm going to touch briefly on a lot of the topics that are going to be drilled down on further by later speakers. So, um, um, so but I, I think this is a, a, a bit of a broad overview, which will include some of the, of the tissue-based uh, research that we've done um, in terms of uh, developing a model as to why HH lesions uh, result in, in seizures. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to uh, do some of the clinical features. Again, those will be uh, also developed by later speakers. Uh, I want to uh, speak a little bit to the issue of why HH has two different clinical syndromes associated with it. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch, sort of introduce the idea that there are surgical therapies, and in fact, now there's many different surgical therapies. And then I want to talk a little bit about the HH tissue in terms of what we have learned about it. Um, we, it has been uh, a relatively uh, good experience over the past uh, 20 years or so in terms of learning more about <clears throat> hypothalamic hamartoma. So here I'm using uh, search terms uh, HH uh, and epilepsy, and then these are basically broken down into five-year increments, starting with uh, 1970 or so. And you can see over the last 20 years, uh, things have really uh, expanded uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of, of new... Uh, publication activity, which usually means new discovery and new research and learning important things. Um, here we have a 2016 to date, and if we extrapolate to that, to this five-year interval, uh, roughly 100 papers, roughly 20 papers a year. So I think we've gone from a very low steady state back here uh, up to now what is probably going to be a new steady state, which will, which will be up in that uh, neighborhood. So um, it, it, it's not a a continually exponentially uh, curve, but probably now a new steady state uh, around 20 papers per year. Um, hypothalamic hamartoma has uh, traditionally two different subtypes that we need to address and deal with. Uh, this is the traditional uh, coronal uh, viewpoint of kind of looking at the world. Is it possible to turn down the lights just a, a little bit? Is that uh, an option? Um, <laughs> So basically, the, the floor, the third ventricle is here, uh, and the, the, the first subtype, the one that we're going to be a little bit more concerned with today, is the subtype relating to epilepsy. Uh, that, that's also called the intrahypothalamic type, sometimes the sessile type or the broad-based attachment. Uh, th these patients have gelastic seizures uh, and frequently have some other uh, comorbidity as well in terms of cognitive issues and also psychiatric issues. Uh, the, second, the second subtype, uh, sometimes called the para-hypothalamic uh, type, uh, is, is basically below the floor of the third ventricle, so attached uh, underneath, um, sometimes also called pedunculated in the sense that it has a very narrow stalk. And this is um, usually associated with precocious puberty and typically does not have epilepsy, cognitive issues, and, and behavioral issues. However, it, it, even though the textbook concept kind of divides the world up into two different um, uh, types, it, it is more of a smooth continuum, and the, those types are really the extremes at each end, okay? So when you, when you have a chance to meet uh, quite a few patients with this condition, you uh, quickly uh, perceive that there's a, a continuum, not only for how the HH lesions look when we look at them with imaging, uh, but also uh, a, a tremendous diversity in terms of how the patients look, okay? So this is a, a condition with tremendous clinical uh, diversity um, from patient to patient, and it, and it truly is uh, a condition where every patient that I meet will have a little nuance that's really unique to them or different from any other, other patient that I've met. So it, and for that reason, it's a very uh, fascinating uh, condition uh, to work with. <clears throat> 
Uh, how common is it? Uh, in Sweden, they have, um, or in Scandinavia, but specifically here in Sweden, uh, they have a pretty good uh, capture in terms of their uh, health care system, in terms of kind of knowing what everybody out there, what kind of diagnoses they have. So the, the, the number that comes out of Sweden is that one in 200,000 children and teenagers have HH <coughs> with epilepsy, okay? Um, and so, you know, we can basically take, you know, the world uh, population numbers and, extra and extrapolate from there. So, you, you know, roughly 50 to 60 uh, kids in the UK uh, have HH with epilepsy. Um, uh, India, uh, which has a very young demographic in terms of its uh, pediatric population, a country destined to be the most populous uh, country in the world, um, you know, probably down near 2,000 patients. The, these statistics would say r roughly around 300 patients. Uh, based upon the number that, that our program has interacted with from the United States, I suspect that these numbers are a conservative esti estimate, probably an underestimate of, uh, of how, common, uh, how common the condition is. So it, it is not a public health problem disorder, uh, but certainly uh, a very important disorder for uh, the patients that have it and for the families that uh, are also uh, coping with it. Um, roughly 95% uh, of patients have the sporadic uh, form of the condition, which is to say there's not a family history for it, and they don't have other obvious medical disorders or malformations or dysmorphology type issues that would relate to an alternative diagnosis. So it's an HH problem, it's isolated and non-familial. Um, about 5% of patients uh, can have their HH associated with another syndrome. The vast majority of those will have a condition called Pallister-Hall syndrome, uh, which in includes some limb deformities and uh, malformations uh, that might affect the uh, epiglottis and the larynx, sometimes the kidneys. So there's other things about them that kind of bring them to medical attention as well. The reason that that's particularly important here is because those patients are known to have a genetic mutation uh, in a gene called GLI3 or GLI3, uh, which is a transcription factor uh, in the sonic hedgehog pathway. So sonic hedgehog is, a, is an intracellular signaling pathway going from the membrane down to the, down to the uh, chromosomes or down to the genes. Um, and uh, so basically that was a little bit of a clue uh, for a place to potentially look for patients with the sporadic form. So basically the question became, well, for the 95% of patients who have the sporadic form, why do they have that? And it raises the question of a somatic mutation, which is to say a tumor-only mutation. So that would come up uh, quite a bit with cancer in terms of, oh, you've developed a cancer, did those cells mutate in such a way that would result in that disease? Um, the, the, the same idea would potentially apply here. So basically, your, your, your body at large has normal genetic information, but there's something, there's a mutation within the HH itself. And so uh, th uh, this has led to a series of papers, but uh, now most recently, uh, uh, just earlier this year, kind of expanding this. And uh, the, the story is, uh, yes, uh, patients with the sporadic form of HH uh, frequently do have somatic mutations, which are identifiable. Uh, the, the number that we're up to now is around 40% or so can be identified. That number will probably go up as we expand uh, genotyping uh, technology even further. So the, the experiment that led to the 37% number was whole exome sequencing, which of course, of course is sequencing uh, all of the gene expressing regions. Uh, the, the next level is probably whole genome sequencing in terms of, of, of doing you know, the entire base pair analysis of the entire genome uh, because there's regulatory regions within the non-expressing areas that impact how genes get expressed. So anyway, but we're up to the idea that 40% uh, uh, of patients uh, have a somatic mutation. Um, the, that includes uh, GLI3 as, uh, as a pathway, as, as, as one of those uh, genes, um, but also includes other members of the sonic hedgehog pathway. And this is a slide that we saw uh, many times yesterday is, Experts in this field were kind of developing that. But basically, there are uh, genetic defects that affect smoothened, which is the transmembrane 
uh, one of the transmembrane membrane receptor type components. Uh, basically, there are uh, uh, proteins uh, later in the pathway that, that uh, uh, take care of phosphorylation, which has to do with activating proteins. Uh, here's GLE3 itself, uh, which then binds to, um, uh, to, uh, to the DNA and then causes change in expression. So basically, this is an example. It, it's a little bit bigger than just uh, GLE3 in terms of a somatic mutation, but this is kind of a good example of a pathway disease. Uh, in which other members of the sonic hedgehog pathway are also affected. I'm going to talk a little bit about precocious puberty because I don't think that any of the other uh, speakers are going to really address that. Um, that's, that's the other flavor of HH. Uh, basically, um, uh, puberty results from pulsatile release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, and I'm going to kind of develop that a little bit on the next slide. Uh, for, for patients, excuse me, for, for patients that have precocious puberty related to HH, they typically don't need surgery, okay? So surgery is something that really is very specific for the epilepsy population, generally not needed for the precocious puberty population because it has an effective medical treatment for the vast majority, okay? And it's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, here we're releasing GNRH to result in precocious puberty here we're administering GnRH to them to prevent the, the uh, puberty, and, the, and the, the, the answer relies in this pulsatile uh, release pattern that's required for puberty. When, you, when we give the agonist therapy, we're using it in a non-pulsatile way. We're kind of flooding the system, lacking the pulsatility, and therefore suppressing puberty. Um, so here, here's a couple slides. So basically this uh, cartoon over on this side relates to that uh, pathophysiology. Uh, here's our GnRH releasing neurons in the normal hypothalamus, pulsatile release, traveling to the anterior pituitary, releasing LH and FSH to the gonads, and then that uh, feedback loop. And then over here is a uh, he, the, 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 this is a, a popular a textbook of, of endocrinology, uh, kind of giving its concept of how precocious puberty works with HH. Uh, here's the normal hypothalamic GnRH neurons, which are quiescent or largely quiescent. And then here is the HH lesion. And this cartoon would represent the idea that pulsatile release of GnRH is arising from the HH and therefore causing per, uh, puberty. There, there is, despite the fact that this figure appears in this textbook, there is no experimental evidence that the HH lesion leads to pulsatile release. So you, you, you want to be aware of that. It is true that uh, HH lesions universally express GnRH, but it, it's not true that we've shown pulsatile release uh, from, from the HH lesion. Um, puberty turns out to be really, really uh, complicated like with a lot of different pathways. Uh, here we have some of the traditional neurotransmitter type pathways with GABA uh, uh, interaction. Uh, here we've got uh, a, path, a pathway that involves kispeptin and its receptor. And then over here we have glial related mechanisms uh, which includes uh, TGF-alpha. And uh, we, uh, because we have an opportunity to study uh, HH tissue, we wanted to kind of uh, address the question, you know, uh, what mechanisms could be at play within HH tissue to give rise to precocious puberty. So we, we looked at a host of these factors on, on the slide that I'm going to show you next. Uh, basically, we're, we're going to include a GnRH, uh, which is, of course, the final common pathway, kispeptin, uh, its receptor, and then TGF-alpha is kind of a proxy for these glial mechanisms. And so uh, we looked at a tissue derived from patients who had a prior history of, preco of central precocious puberty. Okay? That's about 40% of HH patients with epilepsy. Okay? And we found that universally that tissue expressed GnRH, so it is there. Um, universally, they expressed TGF-alpha, and for the most part, they were negative for kispeptin and GPR-54. So implying that perhaps that glial pathway, you know, would be a candidate pathway. Again, we're not proving pulsatile release quite yet, but at least the, the components are there and therefore could work. 
Now, of course, the, the best way to ruin uh, any experiment is to do a control group. Uh, and here we uh, compared it with uh, tissue uh, from patients with HH with epilepsy who did not have precocious puberty. I've got identical slides here because there, there is no ch difference that we can appreciate in terms of looking at the histology. And, oh, by the way, an identical profile in terms of what the uh, tissue is expressing. They all had GNRH. They all had TGF-alpha. And for the most part, they were all for the most part, they were negative for kispeptin and, and GPR54. So here we're looking at the tissue, and we're not seeing any, any difference. So, so why is it that these lesions would be associated with uh, precocious puberty? And the, the answer turns out to be location, okay? Um, so uh, those uh, lesions that uh, resulted in epilepsy and precocious puberty universally had attachment that included the area of the tuber scenarium uh, or, uh, uh, and or the pituitary stalk. Uh, here we uh, have the pituitary gland itself. Uh, you can just see a little gray shadow with the pituitary stalk coming down. And uh, basically, the tuber scenarium is sort of draped right over uh, uh, th this lesion. Uh, whereas those who had epilepsy only, here's the mammillary body, pituitary fossa, pituitary stalk would be right in this uh, neighborhood, uh, lacked attachment to, the, um, to, to that more critical region. So, so basically the, the premise, the, the pr working hypothesis that we have is that all HH lesions are basically created equally. It matters where they attach in terms of what sort of a network they go into. So if you're attached up front, you can release hormone it goes into the uh, infundibular system and can end up in the anterior pituitary. If you're attached posteriorly, you're not connected to that, uh, to that network. So let's flip it around. So let, let's ask the question, uh, why do patients have gelastic seizures? This was a relatively uh, simple experiment. One of, my, one of my colleagues here, Joseph Parvizi at Stanford, uh, worked on this. But it, it, he did a relatively simple thing. He used coronal sequences. Uh, he set the mammillary body as the zero point for measurement, and then util utilizing the coronal sequence and just sort of working it forward, knowing how thick the slices were, knowing if there was or wasn't a gap between slices. He basically measured the anterior to posterior um, uh, uh, size of, of HH lesions. And so this is 100 patients. Uh, each of these horizontal bars represents a single data point for these hundred cases, and you can see that universally that lesions associated with epilepsy were at the same level, very intimate to, very proximate to uh, the mammillary body. Um, and then depending upon the size, um, they would go uh, um, to an extent, but, the, but that, that location for the epilepsy cases always included the mammillary body. So the, the basic premise that we have now then is that lesions that, um, I'm, I'm taking you from that coronal sequence with the above and below the third ventricle idea now to the sagittal sequence where I think actually anterior to posterior is, a, is maybe a more important part of the story. So lesions that are up front uh, have precocious puberty. Uh, lesions that are towards the back, here's the mammillary body here, have epilepsy, and then large lesions the 40% of patients with epilepsy that also have precocious puberty, large lesions that attach anteriorly and posteriorly have both of the syndromes, okay? So they're, they're, when you look at the scan, you can predict if that child should likely have epilepsy alone, likely precocious puberty alone, or both. Um, I'm going to do just a little bit on the clinical features because we're, we're going to get, uh, we're, we have later talks to kind of address them. Um, gelastic epilepsy is the hallmark uh, clinical seizure type associated with HH. Uh, gelastic seizures can arise from other places in the brain, but HH would be like the first three things that you would think about if you encounter a patient with gelastic epilepsy. Uh, they they uh, often begin very, very early. Uh, we encounter uh, mothers all the time, typically it's, it's the mom who will uh, uh, give us this history, that her child was having seizures the day that they were born. I have even had some moms tell me that they were having seizures in the delivery room. And in retrospect, because of the timing of how it occurred, 
probably in utero. Okay. Um, they are uh, very uh, brief, usually, very frequent, uh, usually many, many times a day. Uh, they're notoriously refractory to, to medications. And I'm, I'm going to develop this concept a little bit more towards the end, the, the issue of what is it about the HH lesion that makes it have seizures. Uh, here's here's um, uh, the kind of data that sort of, uh, you know, is the evidence behind the idea that seizures come from the HH. Uh, here's a, a depth wire in the HH lesion uh, that, that corresponds to these electrodes here, and you can see that this ictal pattern here is uh, occurring in the HH, but not, not elsewhere. <clears throat> However, um, it, it's, it's not that simple. Um, so patients with uh, gelastic seizures, particularly those who develop them earlier in life during childhood, uh, will typically go on to have other seizure types. And virtually uh, every seizure type that we can think of uh, can occur in patients with HH, uh, sometimes several different seizure types in the same patient, uh, which includes complex partial and then uh, more generalized uh, types of uh, epilepsy. But, but the, the point here, though, would be that these forms, these types of seizures are quite a bit more disabling for the patient, okay? And, um, and this is the time point uh, at which uh, the epilepsy condition becomes more disabling and the need for intervention really uh, ramps up quite a bit. Uh, it also turns out to be this is the time point where cognitive issues become more apparent as, as do the uh, psychiatric and the behavioral issues. Um, the, the age at which this happens is highly, highly variable, but um, the, the, the maximum range would be kind of in the preschool, early school age uh, range. And, and these types of seizures, I, I don't want to say that they don't respond at all to medication, because I think medications can help reduce the frequency, but again, they're notoriously treatment uh, resistant. So for the vast majority of patients, they won't be well controlled. Um, it, it, it's even a little bit more complex in terms of the history, however. So sometimes these seizures are arising from the HH and spreading, okay? Uh, they may or may not have a gelastic component that shows the beginning of the seizure. But it's also true that seizures begin to arise from other regions of the brain, okay? And this is that uh, concept of secondary epileptogenesis. Uh, it is uh, still a little bit controversial in terms of whether it exists. Not everybody in the epilepsy world accepts that. I think this is the, the human model that kind of makes the case that, yeah, it does. Because um, uh, there, there's very compelling information that we can also record if we do put electrodes inside the head, which we don't usually need to do anymore. But, but back in the days when we did, clearly seizures were starting from other brain regions and not from the HH. But the HH lesion is responsible for those lesions. If you remove the HH at an early time point, those remote seizures can run down and disappear. But over time, they can become permanent. So HH treatment at a, at a later time point can mean that those seizures that have now started to come from frontal lobe or temporal lobe could continue to be uh, important. And one of the things that's statistically significant for predicting success from surgery is the age at which surgery is performed and the, the duration of epilepsy, your lifetime duration of epilepsy. So those that have longer lifetime duration of epilepsy in an older age at surgery are less likely to have success with surgery. So there is a little bit of a clock that's kind of ticking on that. Uh, EEG features, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, EEG is probably our best biomarker for having seizures or having epilepsy, but it's a very imperfect biomarker for HH. Uh, a lot of uh, patients with gelastic seizures have absolutely no change in the EEG by standard, you know, visual inspection and looking, looking at the pages of the recording as, as an eeg -er, uh, which can be misleading for people who kind of don't understand this condition. Families are told that your child doesn't have epilepsy when they've just recorded 10 gelastic seizures. Um, the EEG may not change on the scalp recording because the lesion is deep. 
Uh, and, and there's a host of other things that we can come up with. So, so b basically, the, I, it, it's not that it has zero value, but it does have more limited value for this particular condition. And that's something that needs to be recognized by people who are, are seeing these patients. Cognition. Uh, so th there's comorbidity with the HH. And uh, cognitive impairment uh, is common. Um, it is measurable. Uh, when, we, when we look at uh, a big series of patients here, uh, roughly 35% of patients, roughly a third of patients were normal or very nearly normal, basically functioning normally in day-to-day -day life. Uh, significant deficits, uh, significant learning disability type issues in 20%. Uh, and then also, you know, a, a third or, or even closer to maybe half of patients who would actually test out in an intellectually disabled way. Again, a lot of variability. Some people have the IQ of 68, which puts them into the intellectually disabled range, but other kids quite a bit lower. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, some kids uh, are functioning at a level, I say kids because of course th these kids also grow into adulthood, so this, this does cover the age range. But uh, some patients uh, clearly intellectually disabled to the point that they're not really able to kind of do, you know, standard psychometric type testing. So, so this is sort of a view of the uh, entire universe. Unfortunately, it can be progressive, probably in half of the patients. Um, higher risk for those that have early onset of gelastic seizures and multiple seizure types. <clears throat> Uh, psychiatric issues, uh, th this is a particular area that I think is uh, still left uh, largely unexplored. Uh, we, we have not uh, gotten a, a consistent coming together of the psychiatric community and the epilepsy community to really uh, kind of drill down on this a little bit. I, I think this really is an area that needs additional work. But psychiatric symptomatology is a key part of this syndrome. It's the third piece of the triad, if you will. Um, uh, again, uh, tremendous variability from patient to patient. Virtually every DSM diagnosis that's possible can be observed in this population. But the, the hallmark feature, the one that really kind of stands out as most common and most problematic, is the rage behavior. So poor frustration tolerance, acting out, uh, sometimes physically. Um, and for some patients, that can be the most disabling uh, feature uh, of, the, of the condition um, and the most disruptive, you know, for family functioning. Uh, th so th this introduces the issue of epileptic encephalopathy. What is it about the epilepsy or the lesion uh, that uh, has a bad effect on, on the rest of the brain? Okay, the, the working idea is that for most patients, the day that they're born, they've got the HH in an otherwise normal brain, okay? So epileptic encephalopathy, not just seen in HH, but with other, other childhood epilepsy conditions as well. There is something bad that can happen related to the lesion or its seizures or its EEG patterns that we really don't understand, but it's really important because it, it's really disabling and, and can cause, a, cause a, a, a lot of disability. So here, here's the syndrome, basically gelastic seizures, uh, which start off as perhaps the uh, only problem, but the uh, natural history, unfortunately, can include uh, th these, other, these other issues. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk in a very superficial way now about treatment. Uh, the old way was to always come from below for all patients. Now, coming from below is still appropriate. For, for some patients with HH. But it used to be that that was the only way to get there. And the, the, the complication rate was, was very substantial. There's a lot of uh, uh, very important blood vessels that uh, are down at the base of the brain, cranial nerves and what have you. So the, the, the complication rate, uh, pretty uh, substantial. Um, and the, the, the seizure freedom rate, poor. So it was true up until 2003 or, or, or thereabouts the patients were basically told there isn't anything that you can do, okay? That clearly is not the case anymore. And it, it, in, uh, the story that I'm going to tell basically is that now we have quite a few different things, and the challenge is how to pick out the available treatments for each patient. So the, the, the breakthrough moment, uh, 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 Simon Harvey and, and Jeff Rosenfeld as, as the surgeon, 
uh, basically applied uh, an older surgical approach to a new pathology. So, so Dr. Rosenfeld did not invent the transcolossal approach, but he was the first to apply it to this particular disease state. And lo and behold, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's a longer way to go. You're, you know, creating a hole basically in an important structure. But it, it was a major step forward in terms of, of success rate. So here's the, here's the landscape that we have today. Uh, 2003, um, too few treatments. Uh, 2016, you know, we've got uh, quite a few different choices that you're going to hear about later today. Okay? Um, and just as this is a quick visual run through these, uh, each of these will be addressed by different authors. Here's the transcolossal approach, which does require a craniotomy. Uh, here's the endoscopic, transventricular endoscopic approach, which is more of a burr hole. Here you're traversing the brain into the third ventricle. Gamma knife radiosurgery. Uh, Dr. Uh, Regi, I think, is, will be here a little bit later today to kind of talk about this. So this is converging many uh, beams of radiation to come to a killing point, which can be designed, you know, very carefully to correspond to the lesion. Uh, interstitial brachytherapy is, is done, uh, I think, pretty much exclusively by the Freiburg group. I'm not aware that anybody else is really doing it, but this is putting radioactive seeds in the lesion for a short time and then removing them. Um, the new, I, I'm, I'm still saying the newest kid on the block is the stereotactic thermoablation, but we heard a lot yesterday about focused ultrasound is the newest kid on the block that hasn't quite been applied to patients yet, but something that sounds kind of exciting. But I uh, hear basically, uh, a, Dr. Curry is going to be addressing this later today, but a stereotactic probe heating the lesion in a way that uh, can be monitored by uh, near real-time MRI thermography to really kind of uh, build in a safety component that doesn't exist with other therapies. A classification uh, um, uh, system. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little bit of a shout out to Helen um, as, a, as a leader at, at, at a worldwide level that we, we need to kind of pick a classification system. We had th at least three classification systems that were being referred to yesterday. And, and, the, and, the, and the speakers are not even using uh, which, one are they, which one are they using. This is the one that we kind of like. This is the De La Lande, uh classification system. Uh, and, and, and the point here is, is not that this one's necessarily better than the others, um, but basically it helps us communicate in such a way that we kind of know, okay, who was it that you treated with that particular technique, okay? So this is the uh, De La Lande classification below the floor of the third ventricle, wholly within the third ventricle, spanning the floor of the third ventricle, and then giant. And all of that, all of the treatment discussion can lead us to this kind of an algorithm. There is nothing evidence-based about this. There are no comparative trials that would go head-to-head -head with, let's say, gamma knife radiosurgery versus stereotactic thermoablation. But we are developing a little bit of a sense as to which therapy is appropriate for which kind of patient. So, for example, um, the uh, terional approach, uh, the, the approach of coming below the third ventricle is appropriate for some patients, and specifically that would be the type 1 patient whose lesion is completely below the floor of the third ventricle, right? Whereas a transcolossal approach would be wholly inappropriate for that kind of a patient. But very appropriate potentially for somebody with a type 3 or type 4 lesion. So I just wanted to finish up in the last couple moments here uh, with uh, our tissue-based research. Um, and uh, basically for people in the epilepsy field, it's a very interesting question. You know, what is it about that tissue? What happened to that tissue that makes it result in seizures? And if we understand that, maybe we can treat it a little bit better. So there are some pathologies that we've been working with for, you know, 60 years and hundreds of people or thousands of papers. And there is today still no comprehensive cellular model for any form of human epilepsy that really kind of explains the whole soup to nuts kind of pathway by which seizures would arise. 
So we still don't have that for any form of epilepsy. Um, but uh, hypothalamic hematoma is a relatively new kid on the block in terms of having access to the tissue and kind of really taking a look at it. Um, the, for the audience uh, today, there are two things that you need to have in terms of any epilepsy model. All the rest is in the details. But the two things that you need to have is a, is a net imbalance between excitation and inhibition. That could be too much excitation. It could be too little inhib inhibition or both. Uh, and the other thing that you need to have is you need to have uh, synchrony of neuronal firing. So it's not enough for individual cells to be hyperexcitable, but you need to have them firing together. And, uh, and of course, to, to make the point that uh, all forms of epilepsy are always a network of abnormality rather than just a, a single neuron that's responsible. So uh, here's HH tissue, which turns out to be really quite simple uh, compared to the hippocampus or compared to neocortex, where there are many, many different kinds of cells with different roles. So HH tissue uh, consists largely of small neurons. Uh, the, the, the neurons are the uh, nuclei here with the lacy chromatin and then a dense internal nucleolus, okay? Uh, and th the microarchitecture is a clustering phenomenon, a nodular, nodules of neurons phenomenon. And it's highly variable case to case in terms of how abundant these are and how big they are. They can be sometimes a few cells, sometimes you know, massive numbers of cells. Um, but this, this is basically the, the microarchitecture of HH tissue. Uh, glial cells are these densely uh, staining uh, nuclei there. Um, when, we, uh, when we have the opportunity to do research, uh, many patients are kind enough to let us utilize that tissue for research purposes once it's been removed. Um, that's something that is always done with the patient's permission, of course. And, uh, and then one of the things that we like to do is uh, freshly uh, uh, oxygenated, uh, perfused uh, tissue slice research, which is to say keeping the tissue alive for 24 <coughs> hours or so and being able to study it. How does it behave? So we do microelectrode recordings. Um, and then after those recordings are done, we can inject some cells and then kind of visualize them. Okay. So it, it's rather painstaking research. For any particular surgery, you may just get to study a few cells. There are two neurons that exist within HH tissue. I've already kind of introduced the small neuron uh, population. Th th this would be the time point that it really would be nice to turn down the lights just a little bit, um, if, if we have a, any way of doing that. D does that work for people? That's okay, okay, because otherwise you will miss some of the subtleties on the. Okay, so uh, small neurons uh, and large neurons. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you is that about 90% of neurons are these small little guys here. That's the, the last photomicrograph that you saw was, was exclusively these cells. Uh, however, there are also large neurons as well. Maybe it's 10% of uh, neurons. And I'm going to develop that story for you uh, rather quickly. It's interesting and rather quick to tell. Uh, so Golgi staining here for uh, small HH neurons for three different patients. So these are, these are round, small cells, a very a small number of processes. Sometimes they're unipolar or bipolar. They generally do not have spines on their dendrites, although they do have dendritic beating which is something that is seen with other human epileptic uh, uh, tissues. So these cells, they don't look like much, but they have a very interesting property, which is to say they have intrinsic pacemaker firing. Okay? So it's a little counterintuitive. If you take a tissue slice from other forms of human epilepsy, temporal lobe epilepsy, cortical dysplasia, the cells are not firing when you look at it under tissue slice. Here, these cells are firing actively. So that was actually a very exciting uh, finding to, to, uh, to have, and we, we kind of confirmed it with some complementary uh, type testing. Uh, but basically, when you apply a microelectrode uh, in the uh, tissue slice here, which is a healthier cell, basically you get a continuous firing pattern. Um, so uh, evidence that I'm not showing you right this moment is that these cells are GABAergic. They elaborate GABA as their neurotransmitter. Uh, and so basically these cells have an interneuron type phenotype. 
most interneurons in the central nervous system are GABAergic. Okay? Usually they're the minority of cells rather than the majority. Uh, but basically, the, the model that we have is clusters of these small uh, interneuron-like GABAergic cells which have intrinsic firing activity, okay? These are GABA-releasing cells that are firing actively. There's a lot of GABA going on. It's kind of counterintuitive for the net imbalance problem. There's too much GABA. So then we turn to the large cells. Uh, these are pyramidal cells that are quite a bit more uh, complicated in terms of their branching patterns. They are more likely to have spines, dendritic spines, which is a, patho which is a morphological hallmark that often goes along with excitatory um, um, uh, cells or pyramidal cells. And in fact, when we stain for markers, these cells would stain for markers that go with glutamate or an excitatory uh, uh, function. So, so we think that the, unlike the small cells which have an interneuron phenotype, these look like these are large excitatory projection cells. Okay. These cells also turn out to have a very interesting uh, neurophysiological phenotype, which is to say uh, that when you uh, stimulate them with GABA or a GABA ligand, which is what mucimol is, that, that's a GABA A agonist, these cells, which are quiescent at rest, actually fire, okay? So in other words, GABA is having a paradoxical impact, uh, an immature paradoxical impact. So GABA, rather than being an inhibitory neurotransmitter, as it is most places in the nervous system, here has an excitatory role, okay? So the imbalance issue comes into perspective pretty quickly. There's a lot of GABA going on here. We know that these cells at least when we look at them with electron microscopy, uh, do project to these large neurons, which are excitatory projection neurons, probably sending their processes outside the HH, connecting with the rest of the brain. And these cells actually are excited and they're more likely to fire with GABA, okay? So uh, actually, a, a wor because this tissue is relatively simple, a working model for how this tissue gives rise to seizures came about pretty quickly. So now it needs to be tested and validated, and all those things. I think I'm going to let go of the gap junctions. That's another part of the story which contributes to synchrony of firing. There are gap junctions present within these HH uh, small nodules. Uh, uh, last, last slide. Um, so basically, uh, there's this whole translational research, bench to bedside mantra that, that we all like to talk about. If we look at a neuropharmacology of these HH tissue slices, because basically they do have ictal-like discharges which occur in tissue, tissue slice, we can throw drugs on them and kind of see, okay, like what happens? And these are all compounds that have now been investigated um, with regard to their impact on the tissue slice. So calcium channel blockers, some traditional anti-seizure medications like lamotrigine and levetiracetam, some unconventional um, anti-seizure medications like gap junction blockers and bumetanide and uh, actually just most recently here a cannabidiol agonist. Uh, so these all, these all do have a favorable impact on how the tissue behaves in slice. Okay. There is nothing in the other column, and what that says is that we really haven't had the opportunity to properly test these compounds in people um, with HH and epilepsy. But, but my point here, though, would be that, that there are some uh, promising compounds that I think deserve investigation, and these kind of studies are difficult to do, so it requires kind of a multi-center, multi if not kind of multinational you know, kind of effort to, to look at some of these things. Anyway, so, uh, so that wraps it up for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Are there any of those compounds that have difficulty penetrating the blood-brain barrier? And would there be a scenario in which you could actually pump any of those compounds, anti-epileptics, what have you, directly into the lesion to avoid any side effects or blood-brain barrier Problems or anything like that. Well, you need to go back. Sorry. I'm back. Um,
Yes. Um, okay, so like L-type calcium channel blockers, as you know, you know, because you use them for vasospasm, um, <laughs> some of them penetrate the blood-brain barrier and some of them don't. And the ones that do penetrate are kind of problematic in terms of oral, you know, chronic daily oral administration, right? Um, so, uh, so, th so that, th you know, that would be a nice example of something that maybe if you infuse it, you know, directly, and it, maybe it's into the lesion or maybe it's just into the, into the spinal fluid through a pump. So it's a great idea. I, I suspect that for IRB approval, generally speaking, it's good, we're going to have to show a, a little bit more before we're allowed to start putting in pumps, you know, but, but it's, a, it's a great idea. Yeah, I agree. It would, be, would need an animal model. You know, uh, we'd have to test it in that scenario. And what we understand about convection delivery changes l literally every month. Uh -huh, the, yeah, the simple yeah. concept of pumping something into, an or into a tissue really hasn't turned out all that well. But it, it can be effective at uh -huh. times. And I'm just always looking for ways of getting around the blood-brain barrier limitations you guys have right. as clinical uh, epileptologists and getting yeah. to the cells that are active. Yeah, no, I, I think that's an excellent point. And it could be that, that there's some of those compounds there that, that would work. Um, the, the, the point about an animal model is really critical because, of course, there is no animal model for this condition. And to really do good controlled experimentation obviously requires that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. And do we understand what is the physiology behind the characteristic gelastic seizures? Why, why is it so typical for hypothalamic hematoma? Uh, okay, so, so basically here, here I've talked about uh, why the tissue would give rise to an epileptic discharge. Okay, so that's intrinsic to the tissue. So you're asking really what happens when, whatever the pathway is, what is it activating that makes somebody laugh or smile or smirk or whatever the gelastic seizure might look like? Uh, you know, we really don't know, uh, quite honestly. There, the, the circumstantial evidence is that the HH lesion uh, ties into the mammillary body descending column of the fornix, ascending mammaloflamic tract, which is the limbic circuit, okay? There's some good, pretty compelling circumstantial evidence that that's the case, but there is no direct proof that, that that's the case. But, but somehow it is activating centers, probably brainstem, because there's also connections into the brainstem, that elicit the behavior of, of laughter for most patients not feeling like, feeling, not feeling like something is funny, right? So it elicits the laughter behavior, usually, not always, but usually without a feeling of something's funny. Thanks, Jeff. That's a, a wonderful, wonderful talk. I wanted to uh, draw on your experience of the phenotype, so back to the clinic, mm -hmm. and talk about children and adults and obesity. Is that a recurrent theme that comes up? And also about adult psychiatric manifestations. Well, the the, um, the, the, the psychiatric issues are, are way understudied. Um, <laughs> as you know, for somebody who's had a lifetime of psychiatric dysfunction, it's likely to be worse as they get into adulthood. Um, I'm not aware of anybody. Well, I, I shouldn't. I, th there are a few papers. There 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 are open label descriptive you know uh, types of papers. The the more the paper has follow-up, the fewer the number of patients are in that particular paper, of course, right? But, but, but they are out there. Um, but it, it can be very disabling. And we, we have encountered adult HH patients who have been institutionalized. Um, and we, we were able to make an impact on their seizures. We didn't make much of an impact on their day-to-day -day functional uh, living. Uh, th th there, there are patients that you'll encounter that uh, do have psychosis, yeah, that, that will qualify for a, a, a psychosis uh, diagnosis. And yeah. the obesity? The, the, the obesity. Um, uh, I relate to the obesity usually as a post-op issue. Okay, so the, the, single, the single most common um, side effect or complication that, that we encounter with surgery is increased appetite and weight gain. Okay, so when I'm talking about it with families, I'm usually talking about it as a post-op issue. I, I don't think that I've gotten the sense that it's much of a problem for HH patients in law, at large. Um, 
but but it, it, it may it may be, and I, I think that uh, um, it may be more true in adulthood.